Welcome and thank you all so much for joining us here today. I'm so proud to be part of the Milkweed family and I just wanted to share a couple thoughts about the impact Milkweed has given um, for me as a scholar and as a devoted reader and as now a person who writes for them. I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. I never saw anybody who looked like me represented in any books about the outdoors or in any movies or TV. But Milkweed is my dream publisher because they publish diverse books that help me stay curious and maintain being a lifetime learner about the planet and its inhabitants. The impact of being represented in those landscapes means that more children and teens will realize that there is a place for them in literature about the outdoors, and maybe that will impact their careers, their hobbies, and their lifelong interests. I'm so proud of the impact my book, World of Wonders, has already been having on teens and students all over the country. People are writing to me that they feel seen, and that's exactly how I felt being published and edited by Milkweed. I'm gonna read a paragraph from my collection, World of Wonders, and it's from the chapter called Dancing Frogs. It must be summertime, the season of outdoor dance parties and cookouts, because I cannot get enough of dancing, and more specifically, dancing frogs. I'm not the only one either. Recently, the reptile and amphibian world was rocked by the discovery of a record 14 frogs. Herpetologists first broke the news in Kerala, the state in southern India where my dad is from. This region is a biodiversity hotspot, meaning many of its flora and fauna aren't found anywhere else in the world. All 14 of the new frogs belong to the genus Macrixilis, and herpetologists have named them dancing frogs. Milkweed Editions is one of the only publishers in the country who takes an inclusive and broad vision in deciding who or what gets represented in nature and the environment, and most importantly, who gets to write about nature in the first place. Milkweed has been on the cutting edge for years to make the outdoors more inclusive and welcoming to others who don't necessarily move or look like you. Join me in strengthening this vision so that reading and learning about the outdoors isn't just for a select few, but for readers of all backgrounds. If you open yourself to wonder and learn about plants or animals that you didn't know about before, like if you knew their names and knew the tender way they took turns in caring for their single egg in the crook of a tree, like the potu bird, or if you knew how they used the moon and stars to figure out how to crawl home like the red spotted newt. And if you knew about a family from another culture and knew about how they pulled a blanket up to their son's chin on a cold night, how could you still want to make violence on any of these people and creatures? Thank you so much. I'm so excited that you're joining us and please celebrate with Milkweed Editions in strengthening their vision for bringing books that are magical out into the world. Thanks very much, Amy. Thank you for entrusting with the publication of your work and thank you for your kind words. Good evening, friends. I'm Daniel Slager, the publisher and CEO at Milkweed Editions, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 18th annual Book Lovers Ball. This event has typically been a festive, convivial, in-person gathering most recently in the machine shop across the Mississippi River from our offices here in Open Book. I miss seeing many of you in person, but we're very excited to introduce our organization and a number of the writers we're publishing to a wider virtual audience this year. Thank you all very much for joining us. Over the next hour, you will hear from a wonderfully diverse group of authors across the country. We are here to celebrate the importance of writers and readers and to share the story of what we do at Milkweed Editions. As you know, we are a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to identify, nurture, and publish transformative literature and build an engaged community around it. You are a critical part of this engaged community. Everything you hear about tonight, the writers in the books, and the work we do to connect these books with readers, you make all of this possible. We sell the books we publish, 
and revenue from these sales is a critical component of our business model. But what we do uniquely well, curating a list of transformative literature, working with writers to develop their manuscripts, and promoting books and their authors in increasingly innovative ways is made possible by the support of a generous community of donors, by you, in other words. And so we're asking you this evening to give a donation to Milkweed Editions. Every gift, regardless of size, will go to support writers and their books. And every donation, regardless of size, matters to us here at Milkweed. Our goal at this event is to raise at least $100,000 as a community to support the 70 books currently in development here at Milkweed. Every donation makes an impact. If 1,000 of us were to give $100, we would reach our goal. Your gift represents an investment in writers and in adding original voices and stories to the cultural conversation. This year, your gift also represents an investment in the future of publishing. Last year, funds raised at the Book Lovers Ball supported the Milkweed Fellowship Program a salaried one to two year immersion program designed to offer the tools, experience and exposure necessary to pursue a career in book publishing. Our fellowships are designed for those from communities historically underrepresented in publishing. And they are meant to empower individuals from these communities to advance, discover and champion transformative literature for years to come. All donations raised above $100,000 through this event this year will support the fellowship program. And we have some fantastic news to share with you this evening. Our board of directors and event sponsors have generously provided us with a $40,000 challenge grant. This means that the first $40,000 donated tonight will be matched, doubling the impact of your generosity. Please take a moment now to make your donation by clicking the gift box option at the top of your screen. Thank you for your support. We'll be back together in 30 seconds to hear from current Milkweed Fellow, Kachina Yeager. Hello and good evening. It's so good to be with you all today. Kachini Yeager Makia Fie, Damakota, Tintuita Matama. My name is Kachini Yeager. I am Dakota from Tintuita, Prairie Island, here in Minnesota, Makoche, and I'm a fellow here at Milkweed Editions. I applied to the fellowship program because, simply put, I love stories. I believe they are a fundamental part of what make humans human as well as helps us understand and orient ourselves in a larger cultural framework. Thus, I firmly believe it is imperative to assist in bringing a wide range of transformative and poignant stories into the world. For me, a long-term dream that the skills from this fellowship would benefit me in bringing forward would be to see various tribal nations, including my own, launch publishing endeavors to help bring our own stories into the world with fewer barriers, barriers to entry. Um, although it has certainly been a novel time to start a fellowship, I've already learned so much and I'm absolutely delighted by the work I'm doing. By far and away, one of my biggest highlights to date has been working with Diane Wilson on the cover launch of her forthcoming novel, Seed Keeper. It's been truly moving to get to work with a Dakota author so soon into my fellowship, and in tandem with the cover artist being Standing Rock Dakota beadworker Holly Young, who taught my mother and I how to bead Dakota floral work, it felt like a sign that I was in the right place. I have almost always had the abstract passion for publishing, but not the concrete tools or lessons for actually helping stories transform into books. I'm so very excited and grateful for Milkweed's fellowship program and have already built skills that are undoubtedly going to help me continue to be a good steward and relative to stories in the future. Thank you, Kachina. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Bachmeyer, and I serve as the development director at Milkweed Editions. In this next part of the program, we're going to travel around the country to visit briefly with a couple of writers. I'll ask each of them to share some reflections on working with Milkweed, and a couple are willing to share sneak peeks of book projects they're working on right now. 
So before we head off on our tour, I want to mention our auction, which features the chance to bid on unique experiences with some amazing writers and human beings. You can bid at any time during the program and the auction will close at nine o'clock PM Central Time tonight. All funds raised during the auction support writers and the creation of their beautiful books. So please bid with wild abandon. Now on with the show. We are joined from Nashville, Tennessee by New York Times contributing opinion writer, Margaret Rankle. Margaret is an accomplished writer, but Milkweed had the honor of being the home to her first book, Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss. Margaret's reader, Jan, writes, during the pandemic, I find myself struggling to find balance in my life and in my reading. Too fluffy feels too lightweight for the seriousness of our situation. Too heavy weighs too heavily on my already sorrowful soul. But Margaret Renkel gets it right. Thanks so much for getting it right, Margaret, and for being here with us tonight. Thanks so much for having me, Megan. I'm honored to be here. I would love if you would just share some reflections on working with Milkweed Editions. Well, can I start with just some other books by Milkweed that I have loved over the years? I just Please do. <laughs> I just want, of course, everyone's favorite, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer is a wonder my one of my very, very favorite memoirs and an inspiration to me. Same thing with The Home Place by Drew Lanham, also a memoir in nature. I just absolutely am in love with so many of the poems in Ada Lamone's collection, The Carrying. And of course, there's a, a real clarion call to action in Elizabeth Rush's nonfiction book about climate change, Rising, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist last year. And this year, my newest uh, milkweed love is a collection of essays called World of Wonders by Amy Um This book like so many of Milkweed's books, um, are really instruction manuals for how to love the world, how to love it in all of its glorious manifestations, but also how to be responsible for it, for the planet and for each other. So that's one of the things that I just really love about Milkweed, the, the editorial daring of the place. Um, Milkweed chooses books that are unconventionally structured and it celebrates writers whose voices have not traditionally been heard. And, um, and that means a lot to a 55 year old debut author, but also, um, to somebody who's writing a book that just doesn't look like other books in its genre, because it takes a really it takes a kind of editorial daring and a commitment to expanding our notions of literature. And that's what, um, that's what Milkweed does. And I, the other thing that Milkweed is completely committed to that I love just as much is, is your commitment to the environment and your forest friendly printing practices. That means so much to me that a reader can pick up my book in print and not feel that they're having to choose between reading a comfortable uh, printed page and holding a beautiful object and having uh, and, and having to destroy the forest in the process. With Milkweed, you, you're protecting the forest at the same time. Well, it's our honor to be a partner with you in all of that work, Margaret. And I'm wondering if you would share a little bit about what you are working on next. I'm excited to say that any day now, I'm going to be turning in a manuscript to Joey McGarvey, my milkweed editor, for my second book, which will also be an essay collection. This one is called Graceland at Last, and it's a collection of essays that began their lives as columns in the New York Times. So it's sort of a joint project between the New York Times and Milkweed Editions, and I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, I'm hoping what it does is kind of uh, give a little bit of a look at all the different facets of life here in the South, in the American South. Well, we can't wait to publish it and I can't wait to read it. So thank you. Any last thoughts you want to share with us before we sign off? I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. And I want to um, thank you for your support for this one of a kind publisher. And I hope you'll You'll make a donation tonight to keep this uh, work going. Um, this publisher 
so dear to my heart and I think to my future. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Megan. We are joined from Providence, Rhode Island by writer Elizabeth Rush. One of the most exciting days at our office was when we learned that Liz's debut book, Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore, had been named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Pam, one of her readers, writes, This is an important book that should be read by all. It is not a dry academic read, and you won't find any textbook definitions of climate change or global warming here. Instead, this is a boots-on-the-ground account of what is really happening out there in our world right now. Liz, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Megan. It's a pleasure to be here. I would love if you would just talk a little bit about um, your milkweed story, the impact that milkweeds had on you. So I started writing Rising back in 2010, putting those boots on the ground, doing reporting in vulnerable coastal communities all around the country. But it wasn't until I started working with Joy McGarvey, my editor at Milkweed, that the book really started to come together for me. I would send her every single full manuscript draft, which she would respond to with editorial letters that we'd follow with telephone calls. And each of those was really integral in terms of figuring out the structure for the book, what to leave in and take out. Um, and then when it came time to line edit Rising, I still remember she sent me the draft that she edited and I read it out. I started to read it out loud as I do with my work in my office. And I got to about page five and then I had to run into my husband's office. And I said to him sort of with a great sense of wonder, it's really starting to sound like a book. And I credit Joey with that. Um, I think of her, her attention and care is sort of like the squeeze of lemon into soup. It really helped to make rising shine. I also think that, you know, when we were ready to launch rising into the world, I went out to Minneapolis and spent about four days in the milkweed headquarters with Megan and Daniel and Yana and Joey. And at the end of that time, I felt like I really found my publishing family. I've worked with a lot of different magazines and newspapers over the years, but I never had that sense that my successes and failures, um, my deep wishes for this book and the impact that it could have on the climate change conversation, that all of those things were shared. Um, and I definitely think of writing as communal work and rising is far better for the community, um, the milkweed community that helped carry it out into the world. And for that reason, you know, I would ask you tonight to please consider making a donation to Milkweed. They are an incredible indie publishing house that works um, in support of their authors and in support of the books that they bring into the world. And I can say that your money will go farther and have a more uh, profound impact at Milkweed than any other place that I can possibly imagine. Milkweed has really changed my life and helped Rising become a far better book than it would have been had I written it alone. Wow, that is really beautiful and meaningful to hear. Thank you, Liz. Um, and uh, it's just been an honor to be on this publishing journey with you uh, and to be part of your publishing family. And uh, on that note, thinking about your journey, would you give us a sneak peek at what you're working on next? Sure. So the next book is really about two different journeys that might seem unrelated uh, on, on the surface of things, um, but that, you know, the book attempts to bring into a conversation with one another. So last year I was on a scientific mission um, to the calving edge of Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica. And for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar with Thwaites, the news media has nicknamed it the Doomsday Glacier because it alone could raise sea levels globally four feet. And it could also destabilize the entirety of the West Antarctic ice sheet as it disintegrates, which could cause sea levels to rise 12 to 14 feet globally. At least that's sort of what we think um, until that's because no one had ever been to the place where the glacier meets the sea um, in the history of the planet. 
that is until um, the scientific mission that I was a part of last year went there to gather the first observational data um, from this disintegrating glacier. And so the next book really tells that story, the story of my journey to Thwaites Glacier on board a, an icebreaker called the Nathaniel B. Palmer, alongside a different story, um, a different journey, the journey into motherhood and towards the decision to have a child um, now as climate change accelerates. And so in this way, it's a book um, about thinking about, you know, reproduction and regeneration in the era of climate change. And at a deep level, it's sort of like a eco-feminist <laughs> rewriting of the Antarctic history. Uh, because one thing that I find sort of fascinating and discouraging both is that the first person to ever see Antarctica saw it literally 200 years ago. Um, in 1820. And since then, most of the stories that we tell about that place have been stories of conquest or of exploration or of extraction. And I really went on this mission with a different lens um, in mind. And I wanted to think about, you know, what if we think about Antarctica as a place that we are deeply tied to that shapes us as much as we shape it? And so this next book project sort of addresses that question by thinking about it in conversation with motherhood and the choice to bring another being into this world. So that's what I'm working on now. Wow, we can't wait to read it, Liz. Thank you so much for your work and for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. We are joined from Fort Collins, Colorado by poet, writer, critic, and teacher, Dan Beachy Quick. Over the years, Milkweed has had the privilege of publishing four books by Dan, including just last month, his stunning translation, Stone Garland, Six Poets from the Greek Lyric Tradition, the most recent title in Milkweed's Seed Bank series of world literature. Andrew, one of Dan's readers, writes, Dan's Seeing Backwards is a motion to do away with the conventions of time and biography that plaster great writers inside historical mausoleums. Resuscitated on the page without centuries of critical sediment clogging their throats, they can speak again. Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Dan. Would you just start us out by talking a little bit about the impact Milkweed has had for you? Um, it's, you know, I was thinking back and, and it's been 15 years that I've been in conversation with, with people at Milkweed, um, which is, you know, a career in and of itself in some way. And I had, I had, I had these notions early on as I was coming into poetry, um, inspired by those writers I loved most, these, these 19th century and, and uh, these 19th century poets who also were profound thinkers about literature and about life and, and thought about literature and life in the way that poets do, which is eccentrically and outside the, the inherited logics and, and felt that that was missing in some way in, in, in the letters of, of the day. And, and I felt this real inclination that, that what I wanted to do was, was write in reverie and write in rever and, and write reverently uh, about the books that I loved the most. And, and at the time, and, and to some degree still, that was Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And, and I had this idea that I would would create a book that tried to figure out how to get into and towards the real crisis that that, that book is about, which is formal and philosophic and artistic, and and wrote this this insane insane book that is called a Whaler's Dictionary, and and everything pretends to be a, a kind of dictionary definition that then is cross-referenced with other definitions and, and the idea was a, a reader could open it to any page and and find her or his or, or, or their own way um, through the book over and over again each time creating a new a new sort of reading and and it was unwieldy and and at some level insane I, I sent it to presses and one said they would publish it if I turned it into a hundred page prose poem book Another said 30 years ago he would publish this in a heartbeat, but there isn't any kind of market for it anymore. 
And then I, I showed it to Daniel Slager and he somehow saw within its wild eccentricity also genuine wide possibility and and brought it out into the world. And that book, which which I think is probably still the book that most people know of that, that I've written, um, opened up all kinds of things for me, not the least of which is is becoming the writer I most wanted to be, as if as if in some way, and, it, and it's true, that Milkweed gave me permission to think in the ways I most wanted to think and not to ask questions about audience or market, but instead to trust that what I loved thinking about and loved writing towards were worthy in and of themselves. And, and I try to teach that way, and I, and I, I try to write poems that way, and, and, and I try to translate that way now. Also, a, a thing I simply would not be doing um, if Milkweed wasn't there to, to help me do so. That's beautiful. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for trusting us with your work. It's been an honor to publish you over the years. And as you think about your latest book, which I mentioned is part of the Seed Bank series, would you tell us your thoughts on being included in that series and particularly as an educator, what your hopes are for these books? Yeah. Um, you know, oddly, the, the school that I work at, um, Colorado State University, has one of the world's seed banks. It's a, it's a truly wondrous and strange building. You can get a tour of it in non-pandemic times, though you have to take a, a winter coat because it's this giant library of envelopes in deep freeze. Um, but the, the, the metaphor of it holds in such beautiful ways that, that there are embedded in those envelopes, those things literally made of paper, seeds that can regrow plants that for every kind of endangerment might be lost. And it feels to me that Seed Bank operates along that same very dear philosophy that that we, uh, among the many ways all of us feel endangered now, one of the things so quietly endangered is how it is we've come to know ourselves. And, and how we come to know ourselves is, is through strange materials such as poems and stories and narrative and art and myth and novel. And that Milkweed has opened within its particular auspices uh, a series devoted to making sure that those seeds figure out how to bloom once again strikes me as, as not only a, a profound good for what students will pick these books up. And, and to my mind, who isn't a student? I feel ever more so one. Um, but uh, all, the, all the more importantly, that that it renews our connection to a tradition of seeking meaning in life without which, you know, one fears that, 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 that life becomes a lesser thing and, and seed bank so quietly, but so wondrously um, stands instead of such oblivions. Well, we are so grateful for your partnership in bringing these stories together and sharing them with a new audience. Anything else you want to share with us before we sign off from Colorado? You no, know, I've just been I've been thinking about the beauty of milkweed as a name all all morning and while I was teaching my curious class on pottery and poetry and and thinking of of milkweed as common but but the only food source of the monarch butterfly of migration of transformation of of delicacy of fragility of beauty um, and, and uh, feel that also is is uh, kind of the overriding vision of of the press and and how um, lovingly worldly it is. Um, and 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 in light of that, I, I hope um, who whomever it is that that is watching this um, can find find some resources to support this resource for us all. Um, it's it's one of the presses that is doing the worthiest kind of work and, and, and deserves every support we can give it. Thank you so much, Dan. Great talking with you. Thank, Thank you, you, Megan. We are joined from Lexington, Kentucky by poet Ada Lamone. Milkweed has had the privilege of publishing three of her collections, the most recent being The Carrying. Ada has been a finalist for the National Book Award and winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. 
Her work has reached incredible heights of literary acclaim and appeals so powerfully, both to those who consider themselves readers of poetry and those who don't. Her reader, Michael, writes of the carrying, I've been trying to figure out how to read poetry this year. I've read a bunch, enjoying some, being baffled by others, and gradually feeling my way in. But this collection completely blew the lid off for me. Lamone is masterful, weaving together surprising and beautiful observations of the natural world with powerful human emotions. I don't have the language to explain how good this book is. Just read it. And that's what I say about Ada. Everyone should read her. Ada, it is an honor to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's such a pleasure to, to be here in this unique circumstances. Yeah, thank you. Well, would you want to start by just sharing uh, some reflections on Milkweed and the power of books with us? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that I think Milkweed, um, for me, is really a phenomenal press for so many reasons. But one of that is because they build community. Um, and it's about connection. And it's not always about publishing the hot thing. It's about publishing the important thing. And that to me is a huge difference between Milkweed and many other publishers. Um, the book that led me, um, that really, really changed my world and the carrying, uh, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, as you mentioned, wouldn't exist without it, um, was Robin Wall Kimmerer's Breeding Sweetgrass. Um, so that was a book that I don't think I can imagine having written the poems I, I wrote in the last, you know, five years without having read. Um, and I owe that to Milkweed for, for publishing that book. Um, and I, I think that that's an example of the kind of work that Milkweed does, which is making sure that the work they're doing is important that it is aligning and centering with their goals, the goals of the world, with their heart, their minds, their soul. Um, and it never feels like it's all about capitalism and the dollar bill, it just doesn't. And um, that is very, very, very unique, as most of you know, uh, as you know, in the literary world. And um, because of that, it has felt like home. Um, since 2010 with Sharks in the Rivers um, and before that with its publication um, or with its, you know, um, going into publication, uh, I have felt like it's a real community and uh, it's built with trust and it's a foundation of, of belonging. And uh, it's rare that you get to be seen fully by a press. Um, and what I mean that is, is, is not seen as a commodity, but, but to be, to be, to be beheld. Um, and I think that's the gift that Milkweed has given me over the last 10 years. Well, it's been our absolute privilege and pleasure to be on this, uh, publishing journey with you. Um, anything else that you want to add before we sign off from Lexington? Um, I think I just want to add that it's really, I can't tell you how much, how, how fully and deeply books have been saving me right now. And um, so I hope those, everyone who's listening and participating in this wonderful evening um, really recognize that importance and that, you know, we need food and we need clean water and we need shelter and we need connection and we need equality and we also need imagination and that, books allow for us to have that imagination and empathy and connection, especially right now. I hate the phrase now more than ever, but it feels like uh, there is an urgency um, and books have been saving me and um, particularly the books that I have been ordering from Milkweed. And um, I hope that you can contribute if you can this evening so that um, so that we can keep having those beautiful books in our, in our presence, in our hands and they can be a sort of touch when we feel so abandoned by touch right now. Thank you, Ada, so much. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you. Before we head into the final portion of tonight's program, I'll share that you can find books by these amazing writers by clicking on the auction button, then the retail bookstore. 
And don't forget to keep bidding on your favorite auction items too. The program video will follow you wherever you go while you navigate the site. And last but certainly not least, thank you so much for your generous donations. This is community supported literature where you truly make every book published by Milkweed possible. Friends, it was more than a decade ago that Robin Wall Kimmerer approached us with the manuscript that would become Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. By the time we first published this book in 2013, we knew we had something special, a singular gift from a true visionary, an Indigenous woman, a botanist, and an absolutely beautiful writer. But at that time, we could not have understood the extent to which this book would change the way people around the world see the world, and in many cases, the way people live in the world. This is the true power of transformative literature, but you don't need to take my word for it. Let's listen to what some of the readers of Braiding Sweetgrass have to say about what the book has meant to them. This video is to thank Robin Wall Kimmerer for Braiding Sweetgrass. Braiding Sweetgrass is the book that I've recommended more than any other book for perhaps the last five years. Braiding Sweetgrass is a book about hope and possibility, and it's also a book about accountability. You inspire me to be unapologetically indigenous. For me as a Native Hawaiian, to be grounded in place and purpose. It's like I would look at like pictures on Instagram of people like hiking in Oregon in the mountains, and I'd be like, oh, that that's it. Like here's boring. Like this is nothing. Um, and Robin really helped me like dismantle the book, helping dismantle like that marketing of nature. Um, and I really deeply learned to like be present here and love like the trees and roots and soil and birds here in Illinois and now I like feel most at home in Illinois woods. I especially treasure the concept of mutual flourishing um, as an antidote in many ways to this age um, but also as a preview of what we could be moving toward if we were uh, listening deeply enough and were courageous enough and understood what it meant to be in relationship. So thank you, Robin. Um, it really has been such an important um, Bible almost for me in terms of how to live on the land, how to take care of the land, how to appreciate that the land is taking care of me. Um, her lessons and reciprocity are ones that I'm going to continue to learn my entire life, I think. But I keep it by my bed along with Mary Oliver and Joy Harjo's poems. It's like my Bible, I go to it to refer to when I need to recenter, and I just thank Robin so much for this book. Mahalo nui loa, my sincere and heartfelt appreciation for your passion, your spirit, and your dedication. Your work is truly transformational. Mahalo. I want to thank you, Robin Wall Kimmerer, for writing such a beautiful book. Braiding Sweetgrass is a love letter to the planet and a roadmap for how we can live together in harmony with each other and the natural world. And I'm so grateful. Thank you for those greetings from readers. I'm, I'm really touched by those sentiments and, and the community that we've created together. And I'm really honored to be part of this celebration of books and readers. All gratitude to Daniel for visionary leadership, for the staff, the writers, the booksellers, the patrons, the community of supporters and donors, and of course, gratitude to the readers, without whom we would all be sitting essentially at an empty table. I also offer my gratitude to the trees whose cells make up the paper, so much paper, to carry the words into the world. And if ever there was an endeavor worthy of that sacrifice, I think that is it, to become the carrier of pages that carry such meaning in a reservoir of stories that spanned for 40 years in the making, from Ed Abbey in 1980 to Diane Wilson in 2020. 
As a botanist, I can't help but appreciate a publisher who uses milkweed as its namesake, that most remarkable of plants. And as you probably know, the plant reference is invoked since milkweed is the food of the cherished monarch butterfly. The milkweed plant is quite literally the foodstuff of metamorphosis and the fuel for transformation and a symbol of milkweed's mission to publish transformative literature and the books that change lives. And this evening, I want to share with you such stories that change lives, beginning, I suppose, with my own. And when I conceived a braiding sweetgrass close to 10 years ago now, I knew what I wanted to write, but I didn't know if anyone would want to read it. And despite a lifetime as a reader, I had never seen my own sort of story on a page a native scientist in love with land and language, with spirit and with science. I didn't have an agent, but I sent it off anyway, unsolicited like a milkweed seed. But it was much more than an accident of seeds on the wind that brought me to milkweed. In thinking about where to send it, I followed the path created by the books and the writers who are my heroes. Gary Paul Nabhan, Kathleen Dean Moore, Alison Hawthorne Deming, Robert Michael Pyle, Janice Ray, and their footsteps led me to milkweed. And I am so proud that Breeding Sweetgrass shares a shelf with them and a 40-year legacy. And I'm remembering that when I was asked by my friends and colleagues, what sort of book was Braiding Sweetgrass? Was it a plant book, a, a Native American book, an environmental book, a feminist book? I really couldn't say. Um, I said, all of the above? Um, was this a memoir or a manifesto? I wasn't entirely sure myself. And so this led to a dilemma when people also asked, as if this would solve the problem, well, what section of the bookstore does it go in? Where will it be shelved? And so I asked that at, at, at Milkweed, and the answer came from all of you, from editors and designers and booksellers and readers, the puzzle of what shelf does it belong on? And the answer really came from my editor, Patrick Thomas, to whom I'm immensely grateful, who said, what shelf does it belong on? It belongs on the front shelf. And no one was more surprised than me. And I'm really proud, of course, of all of us for the way that the book has made its way in the world. But most gratifying to me is the process. And you might know that Sweetgrass herself is not a plant like milkweed that broadcasts seeds. It's moved hand to hand in a gift economy. Since time immemorial, as long as people have used sweetgrass, we have accelerated its movement across Turtle Island by transplanting clumps past hand to hand, bringing sweetgrass to live beside us, to share with a friend. And that's how sweetgrass is best propagated. And as the numbers of printings grew beyond what I think any of us imagined, I was deeply moved when I learned that the way the book was moving in the world was also hand to hand. I heard from you all that the booksellers were saying that they offered it to their customers and then they came back for a stack of them explaining that they needed to share it with their friends. Readers wrote that they were giving their copies away, sharing it with coworkers and family saying, I think you need to read this, and like witnessing to this is what I believe, like a manifesto of love for the world. And how satisfying, a book passing lovingly from hand to hand. And this beautiful new edition celebrates all of those hands, yours among them. And I was asked to comment on how it has changed my life, of course, and I feel deeply responsible to the book and to the readers. So it has made me way busier in continuing to support Braiding Sweetgrass. It's given me a megaphone, and boy, has it given me email, the deluge that I cannot hope to answer and so feel perpetually guilty. Postcards, letters, and digital posts which make me smile when autocorrect plays a role. 
autocorrect to my way of thinking is like the great comedian of the of the digital age in which I learn I have written books variously titled Praising Sweetgrass. Well, that's true. Raising Sweat, Braising Sweetgrass, Braiding Sweetbreads. And now I'm waiting for the title Braising Sweetbreads. As a writer, I adore the solitary nature of, of writing the immersion in place and language and swimming in the lake of metaphor, but nothing in the encounter with a blank page and a pen in your hand prepares prepared me for this plunge into public exposure, which I'll admit has been a challenge. It's been such a privilege for me thinking that I was alone in my longing for this community and communion with the living earth to find that community growing spontaneously at my feet. It feels to me like a fairy circle of mushrooms popping up around an old tree. But it really hasn't changed the way I am. The other day I was digging trenches to plant purple potatoes in my garden, wearing my baggy old garden pants, fleece with it's not dried on the sleeve. My mother's old Wellingtons, my hair wild and escaping under old hats and cheeks streaked with, with mud and probably burdock roots poking out of my pocket. And I was just talking to the birds on the fence when my neighbor, and fortunately my dear friend, uh, wandered over and burst out laughing. She said, where is my camera? Isn't this exactly the image that comes to mind of a New York Times bestselling author? <laughs> I was I was tickled by that um, um, because that is the the real me and the life of the book has honestly been very different from from my own life. I think of us almost as as separate beings. The milkweed plant is yes about transformation of leaf to butterfly, but as I teach my students in my ethnobotany class, as if that weren't enough, there's so much more cordage to bind us together, nectar for a whole ecosystem, rhizomes resistant to disturbance, and seeds that spread so far. And right this moment, the meadow out behind my house is so full of milkweed sending out their seeds on those beautiful gossamer parachutes of theirs, spreading them far and wide on, on graceful plumes. And as a publisher, Milkweed is responsible for the dissemination of so many brave ideas, partnering with the authors to equip each seed of a book with the capacity to fly. With books, as with seeds, we don't know where they'll land, but we have faith in their generative power. And the seeds of braiding sweetgrass have flown so far, it amazes me to think about translations in Chinese and Korean and Polish and Catalan. And those seeds from milkweed have names for me and probably for you too. Richard Wagamese, Amy Leach, John Elder, Susan Power, seeds that have grown and blossomed and enriched the lives around them and around us. One of the things that was really reinforced for me in the glow of braiding sweetgrass is that I didn't fully know the way that sharing your truth is an invitation to others to share theirs. And this comes forward in beautiful and mysterious ways. And so I wanted to share with you the impact of braiding sweetgrass to share just a few stories of how the book has rippled into the world. Something you heard in the video Something important to know about the milkweed plant is that milkweed is nourishing, not only to monarch caterpillars. I know you've probably thought it was poisonous, right? Most people do. And, and, and you're not wrong. The mature green parts are toxic. They're full of cardiac glycosides. But the young green shoots, brand new emerged, are delicious spring greens. And the green flower buds and the young pods, all of those can be cooked as a Vegetable so delectable that uh, uh, Beth Dooley could write about them in a in a milkweed book. Milkweed books are nourishing too, um, of new food, of new ideas, of new writers, and movements for social justice and environmental integrity, and nourishing other artists. 
In terms of impact, braiding sweetgrass has certainly changed my life in important ways, but in what's most important is how it's changed others. And I wish that I had time tonight to share with you all the stories that have been shared with me of couples who have been courting by copying out passages for their beloveds, of a daughter who read it by phone to her blind father across the country, babies named Hazel, bikes named Wingoshk, companies named the fourth sister, students to teachers and teachers to students, lichens being incorporated into wedding vows, the Thanksgiving address recited around holiday tables. Most touching to me of a woman who shared with me that she was reading Braiding Sweetgrass to her mother in hospice, saying, if I could choose the last words that my mother hears, I want it to be these. Folks have sent photos of their books as companions in a dugout down the Amazon, atop a mountain, on a train, in a hay bale, in the barn during nighttime stint of birthing piglets. In braiding sweetgrass together, we have braided a community, awakening a celebration of our shared longing to restore right relationships with the earth. And that impulse is heard in the music that's grown from braiding sweetgrass. Extraordinary compositions, I couldn't believe it. From Srinivasan's oboe concerto for Sarah Fraker to Lawrence Cole's very singable songs for community choirs to celebrations of asters and goldenrod and Cheryl Lirandel's Cree round dance anthem called Chi Miigwech Mashgiki Ah, in which the birds and the water and the people all sing together their promise to take care of the plants the way that the plants take care of people. It has been a chorus of music so unexpected. And the graphic art outpouring, I had no idea. Um, posters of The Land Loves Us Back, A Sweet Grass Mandela, The Handmade Art Book of Minidawak. There are more of goldenrod and asters paintings exemplifying the power of gift that Lewis Hyde reminds us of, that the gift grows with every giving meant to be shared. And I have to tell you, I'm really humbled and, and grateful to the artists and the musicians and artists of every kind. Creations that have been shared with me include a knitting pattern named braiding sweetgrass, a bread recipe, films, podcasts, and a dance called sweetgrass. And if you have spent any time in a meadow in June, you've probably been bathed in that pink fragrance. So sweet, you think you're at the perfume counter. That's milkweed, that lush scent, heavy on the summer airs, almost dizzying in its, in its beauty. And it's a beacon for pollinators, isn't it? Pollinators of every sort, bees and butterflies and, and beetles. Like its namesake, Milkweed Editions, too, is a beacon, a source of beauty in the books of poetry and stories that emanate from its flowering. The flowering of art from Braiding Sweetgrass Stories has been amazing to me, but even more so is the demonstration by readers that the gift economy is alive and well and is being nurtured by so many. This is a book, book that in its pages calls for reciprocity, and it is quite literally an invitation to give your gifts to Mother Earth, and readers are doing that. Readers and their actions are lived reciprocity, gifts in return for the gifts, and it fills me with hope. Back to our namesake plant, milkweed. It has another attribute that you might not know as a valued source of fiber to traditional people. Fiber beneath the surface. You don't see it at first. Like a good story, you have to go beneath the surface. And there are layers of creamy white fibers there that are twisted into twine called cordage, material that can bind us together, stitch us up. Milkweed books, too, I think, bind us together, creating ties with one another of shared experiences, a common purpose, and books that bind us together across cultures and across generations, as well, are milkweed books. Across Generations by Anne Zwinger, Cultures, Eric Gansworth, Edward Abbey, Scott Russell Sanders, Galsan Chinag. 
And in the spirit of the fibers that bind between generations, I offer also a deep bow to the teachers who have written Sweetgrass into their curricula, from forest preschools for toddlers to university courses and everything in between. A teacher who centers high school biology around the Thanksgiving address. The MBA instructor who challenges his students to construct an honorable harvest business plan and intentional community connecting elders and citizens with special needs in in a nature-based setting, a community called Sweetgrass. The professor of theology who challenged his students to write new liturgies for the earth, and they did. Community-wide reads where the book has been chosen as a shared read from a tiny town in Alaska to a Midwestern city and a First Nations community in Ontario. My dearest hope for braiding sweetgrass was that the stories be, in some way, a medicine for broken relationship with the living world. And when I began writing Braiding Sweetgrass, in what seems from this moment, in the midst of a global pandemic and a contagion, arguably, of trampled values, It was written in a more innocent time when climate catastrophe was just a hot glow on the horizon. We could smell the smoke, but her home wasn't yet engulfed in flames. There was guarded optimism for leadership on climate change, justice for land and beings, human and otherwise. But a lot has happened since then. In climate urgency, in calls for racial justice, undermining science, the political upheaval of bile windigos who've come to offices around the world, and all the wounds they have inflicted on land and people and our values. The accelerating tragedy of species loss, I don't need to tell you anymore. You know it too well. And all of that evidence might suggest to us that the medicine of plant stories hasn't worked that the powerful purveyors of destruction are still in power, the ones at the top. But readers have given me plenty of evidence that where the real change happens is person by person, school by school, acre by acre. Plants like milkweed have deep reservoirs of resilience that can even push up through pavement. And so do we. We can follow their example because the word for medicine in our Potawatomi language, mishkikin, means the strength of the earth. And that medicine, the strength of the earth, is hard at work, healing people and land. There's just one more example, a particularly important one in this time when the forests of the West are burning. You might remember in the essay, Burning Cascade Head, which is about new science stories and an ancient land story twine around each other in an iconic landscape on the Oregon coast. Indigenous caretakers used to burn that headland in an act of renewal, which was both cultural and ecological, but the practice was lost with colonization. And we know that the absence of indigenous fire threatens erasure of rare species and, in fact, erasure of a whole way of being in reciprocity with land. And if you ever doubt the power of story to transform, hear this story. In the fall of 2018, the land steward at Cascade Head sent me a video clip of people with drip torches putting fire on the land at Cascade Head. Fire on the land in the way it was intended. She said, the science told us what to do. History told us what to do, but we didn't act. It was the story that propelled us into burning Cascade Head again. And that power of story to transform to action is um, this power to, to activate. I also want to send thousands of messages of gratitude for readers who have convinced me of this power of story to transform. I think about the courage of folks in Czechoslovakia who sent photos of banners embroidered with quotes in Czech from braiding sweetgrass in an extinction rebellion 
protest from a young indigenous woman deciding to go to college after being inspired by the book and another writing book of her own. Messages of despair and grief for the state of the world and messages of determination and courage to find a new way. People who report that braiding sweetgrass was the lever that changed their lives, leaving jobs in established enterprises that no longer seemed like what the world needs in this moment, to start a school, to work at a nature center, a green business, a farm, to become fully engaged in activism on behalf of justice for land and people. And in this season of elections and choices for the world that we love, messages of how braiding sweetgrass has motivated voters to cast ballots on behalf of the living earth. May it be so. Milkweed, the plant, is also known for its tenacity and its resilience. All the while it's making flowers and seeds and feeding blood butterflies, it's also creating a deep underground network, a strong foundation of rhizomes, each of which can produce new plants and extend the reach of the milkweed ecosystem. Those are the foundations of resilience and renewal and longevity, which support the flowering above. Once established, it's not going anywhere. There's no question of that model, no question of its staying power and its impact in the literary ecosystem. All gratitude and celebration to this remarkable milkweed community. And I want to end with a quote from the beautiful broadsides designed by the milkweed designers. The words they chose are these, together, this is how the world changes. We have braided a sweetgrass community, awakening for each other, the knowing that we are not alone. The strength of that community has the power to activate change and our collective rhizomes are spreading. Meet you, miigwech, thank you. Robin, Amy, Dan, Margaret, Elizabeth, Ada, thank you. Thank you for entrusting us with publishing your work and thank you very much for being with us this evening. And hearty thanks to all of you for spending this evening with us. On behalf of the staff and board of Milkweed Editions, let me say that we are profoundly grateful for your support. We are a lean organization. We are committed passionately to fulfilling our mission. And in order to do so, we need your support. If you've made a gift already this evening, thank you very much. If you could make a gift yet this evening, please consider joining our community of supporters. And again, thank you very much.